motorsport is all about fast cars, noise and epic performances. Except that it's not just about that. For every win, there's a loss. For every high, there's a crushing low. That is what makes the sport part of it so enticing. Sometimes, that low is in the form of a heartbreak that seems to grab your very soul and attempt to pull it from your body. Of all those disappointments, here are the ones that affected us the most. And before you ask about Senna or Clark, we've decided to stick to heartbreak over tragedy. If you do enjoy this video, please remember to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more from Goodwood Road and Racing. Where better to start than one of the very biggest heartbreaks of all? Can there ever have been a more mind-boggling heartbreak than the end of Toyota's challenge for victory at the Le Mans 24 hours in 2016? Toyota has a history of letting Le Mans win slip through its grasp, from punctures in the 90s to grinding to a halt after a small wiring fire in 2014. But in 2016, surely, surely now, the curse was lifted, right? Toyota had raced for 23 hours and 55 and a bit minutes and was in first and ready to do just one more lap to win the whole thing. Then, Kazuki Nakajima began to slow down. It must have been time for one of those classic Le Mans formation finishes. Uh, but then the sister car passed him and sped off. And then he crossed the line to start the last lap and shuddered to a halt, the other side of the wall to his helpless pit crew. All at the circuit, drained after a 24-hour race, struggled to comprehend what was going on. Toyota executives looked on dumbfounded. Porsche stared, looked confused, and then went mental, perfectly reasonably ecstatic at the sudden realisation that it was going to win. In Nakajima's TSO50, a connector between intercooler and turbo had failed, and the Toyota TSO50 was dead stick. Nakajima climbed out and into the arms of his devastated team. The final hammer blow? Due to the rules at Le Mans, the car needed to finish the final lap and cross the line to finish, so it wasn't even classified. No Welshman has ever won the World Rally Championship. Just think about that. No one from the spiritual home of British rallying has won the WRC crown. But in 2020, Elfin Evans could change all that. A move to Toyota at the request of Sebastian Auger himself, and two rally wins meant an 18-point lead coming into the final rally of the season. He was going to win it all. He led at the end of Stage 10, set fastest first sector in Stage 11, and then black ice. Snow began to fall after Evans entered the mountains near Milan. As he approached a right-hander, his Toyota Yaris suddenly snapped sideways. Evans, letting out an anguished insult at his car, was powerless to stop it from dropping backwards off the roadside. Yeah, and that was it. Nothing could get the car up the bank. Auger would win a seventh title with his third different team. Showing an amount of spirit that we doubt we'd have conjured up, rather than sulk, Evans scrambled up the bank and ran down the road to warn his teammate about the ice, basically saving Auger's title. The 24 Hours of Le Mans needs three drivers to win, right? Today, there is maximum driving times that mean two is the very minimum that can even complete the whole event. But what about doing the whole thing on your own? That is what Frenchman Pierre Levesque tried to do in 1952, and he came within an hour of winning the whole thing. Levesque took the drastic decision to Ironman the great race after missing out on victory previously due to teammate errors. He did actually start the race with a teammate, but when he was four laps clear, as night began to fall, he felt a vibration in the Talbot and refused to hand the car over. It was a foggy night. Broken cars began to litter the road. The Mercedes W194s chasing him had to drive with their gullwing doors open just to see, but Levesque pressed on alone. His team would describe how he seemed more and more manic with each passing pit stop, the strain of racing clearly taking its toll, but somehow he still led. And then he disappeared. The crowd saw the Mercs sweep by, craned their necks, and there was no sign of Levesque. He was stood at Maison Blanche, 
tiredness had perhaps finally taken its toll. Levesque missed one of the tens of thousands of gear changes he needed to do, and the Talbot died. So far ahead had he been that it took 20 minutes for the following Mercedes to pass him for the lead. Four drivers could have won the 1986 championship. Prost, Senna, Piquet, Mansell. Halfway through the final race of the season at Adelaide, though, that number seemed to be just one. 63 laps into the 82-lap test, Mansell was third. More than enough to secure his first F1 crown. Even though PK and Prost were ahead, that third place was enough. And then, as he came to Lapakar, it happened. Murray Walker screamed, and look at that, as Mansell's right rear Goodyear deconstructed itself into marbles and court. Mansell held on manfully, wrestling the big Turbo Williams to a halt down an escape road. But one twitched attempt to move the stricken after 11 showed that that was it. His race was run. Williams called in the sister car of PK to make sure his tyres would make it to the end, and in doing so handed the title to Prost, who was able to take victory under only slight pressure from a furious PK. While PK would win the title the following year, it was another six and a retirement before Mansell got his first. Colin McRae versus Richard Burns. That was the big story of the Rally GB in 1998, but neither of the home heroes could actually win the title. That battle was between Spain and Finland, a fight between Carlos Sainz and Tommy Mackinnon. For the Finn, it was simple. Stay in front of Sainz and win. But then he went and ripped the rear wheel off his Mitsubishi, and the title was off back to Spain. Sainz, already a two-time champion, knew how to bring this home. He entered the final stage of the rally in fourth, enough for title three by a single point. As he entered the final few hundred metres, he must have begun to think that it was happening, and then his Toyota Corolla coughed, spluttered, and stopped. Nothing, it would seem, would refire it. Within sight of the finish, it was too much for co-driver Carlos Moyer, who launched his helmet through the stricken Corolla's rear window in disgust. So unexpected was this failure that Mackinnon wasn't even there. He was in the middle of a TV interview about how his season had ended in failure when he got a phone call saying he was the champion. For 30 seconds in 2008, Felipe Massa was the Formula One world champion elect. And then he wasn't. The 2008 season was nail-biting. It was full of intrigue, bust-ups, steward interventions and on-track battles. And it all came down to the final race. And it turned out the final lap of the final race. Massa had to win and rely on Lewis Hamilton finishing lower down the order. For the majority of the race, Massa did what he needed to do and Hamilton just tracked him, easily set for a points haul that would win him the title. And then it rained. Massa and Hamilton stopped for wets. Massa carried on in front and Hamilton emerged in the right place again to win the title. Just. But then Sebastian Vettel passed the McLaren and the story completely changed. Hamilton could not close back to Vettel. So as Massa crossed the line, he celebrated, and the Ferrari pits went wild, having won the driver's title for the second consecutive year. But then Martin Rundle spotted it. Is that Glock? He shouted, as Hamilton swept around a slower car. It was indeed the German, who had stayed out on dry tyres and was now struggling to keep his Toyota in a straight line. The celebrations instantly switched garage, and Hamilton's team celebrated just as wildly. It is to Massa's great credit that he somehow still managed to face standing on the podium afterwards. There was a period when J.R. Hildebrand seemed to be the next big thing in IndyCar circles. He dominated the junior ladder and made his IndyCar debut with a couple of races in 2010. In 2011, he signed on to replace Dan Weldon at Panther Racing, and all eyes were on the young American. Results were iffy, but he was the fastest rookie in qualifying for the Indy 500 and managed to stay on the lead lap for the whole race before a smart fuel gamble by his team left him leading with a matter of tours to go. As he lapped consistently, it seemed like a new home hero was being born. This Indy 500 win would herald a new career at the top of the sport. And then, as he rounded the final corner, inexplicably Hildebrand decided to lap Charlie Kimball around the outside rather than just following him through. 
On the dirty part of the track, Hildebrand slid helplessly wide, crunched into the barriers and ripped the front right of his car to pieces. He did keep his foot in and crossed the line, but in second. After Dan Weldon, whose seat he'd taken for the race, had swept past him to take an unexpected victory. For Hildebrand, it would be the closest he ever came to IndyCar glory. Those are the moments of motorsport heartbreak that have affected us the most. But what have we missed out? Let us know in the comments below.